My name is Clark Murdoch. I'm the director for the project on nuclear issues. Uh, it's a program, as many of you know, that has uh, uh, sort of a threefold mission try to create a networked community of young professionals across the nuclear enterprise. Uh, secondly, to generate new thinking about nuclear issues and also to contribute to. Um, that's my. That's my folder right there, so you'll have to sit someplace else. <laughs> uh, my only role in this is, first of all, just to say that Pony is a program that is intended to provide opportunities for young professionals to, uh, I guess, essentially career development, professional development, uh, train the next generation of leaders. Uh, most young professionals prefer to be called next generation leaders, but I'm an old guy, so I still call them young professionals from time to time. My only role here is to actually introduce the young professional, who the next generation leader rather, who will be running this show, Stephanie Speed. Um, thanks, Clark. Um, so, like Clark said, uh, my name is Stephanie Spees. I'm a research assistant here with the Project on Nuclear Issues. Um, thank you all for coming to tonight's live debate on U.S. policy towards Iran. It's actually the second in a two-part series that we've hosted um, over the past month or so, um, the first of which was about the efficacy of sanctions towards Iran. Um, it can be viewed on our website. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about the military option against Iran. Um, as most of you are aware, tensions between the United States and Iran have increased in recent months. The military option in particular has featured quite prominently in discussions in the media and amongst policymakers and academics about potential policy solutions towards the nuclear issue. Um, in particular, recent statements by Israeli officials, as well as new information from both the IEA as well as the U.S. intelligence agencies um, about Iran's nuclear activities uh, over the past couple months have increased the salience of the military option in these discussions. And um, at the same time, the Obama administration has still uh, primarily pursued a strategy of diplomacy and financial sanctions as a means of dealing with the Iran nuclear issue, yet it still maintains that all options are on the table. So this debate is obviously very relevant, especially in the past couple of weeks, as you all probably noticed in the media. Um, so I think both debaters would agree that the Iranian nuclear threat is one of the most important issues that's currently facing the United States, and probably I think most people would agree the world, um, although they disagree about the uh, benefits and costs of using mil the military option as a means of resolving that dispute. So tonight's debate will address the following resolve statement. Uh, the United States should take military action against Iran to ensure that it does not develop a nuclear weapon. Um, and on the affirmative, we have Dr. Matthew Kranig, um, who's currently a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and an Assistant Professor of Government at Georgetown University and was also formerly a special advisor in the office of the Secretary of Defense from 2010 to 2011, where he worked on Iran policy and defense strategy. And on the negative, we have Dr. Colin Call, uh, who's a senior fellow at the Center for New American Security and an associate professor in the Security Studies program at Georgetown University, and also uh, was a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense um, for the Middle East. So. Um, the structure of this debate that we're going to use is that both debaters will give opening remarks for about 10 minutes, um, and then they will each have five minutes to cross-examine one another. Um, then I'll ask a few follow-up questions, and we'll open up Q&A to the audience, and then both debaters will have an opportunity to give final closing remarks. Um, so with that, we want to get started. The first speech. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for that introduction. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. I'd like to thank CSIS for hosting this important debate. Uh, I would like to thank my uh, fiance, Daniela Helfit, uh, for being here with me tonight. Uh, and I would like to thank all of you for coming out. It's a beautiful spring evening in Washington. Uh, but I think you made the right decision to be here. Uh, you, uh, you have some expert debaters on stage. Uh, apparently our moderator was a debater in college. Uh, Colin, uh, some of you may know, actually won a national championship in debate at the University of Michigan in college. And I once got an A minus in a seventh grade public speaking course. So um, you're in for a real treat, I think. Um, but um, turning to the, to the subject at hand, I, I think that Stephanie's right, that Iran's rapidly advancing nuclear program poses the greatest emerging national security challenge to the United States. 
And uh, deciding how to deal with this problem, I think, is the uh, biggest uh, issue facing the United States government right now. And as I see it, there are only three ways that this issue is going to be resolved. Uh, first, we could get some kind of diplomatic settlement with Iran. Second, we could simply acquiesce to a nuclear-armed Iran. Or third, we could conduct military action designed to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, now, clearly, a diplomatic settlement would be uh, the best way to resolve this issue, uh, if we could get a diplomatic settlement. Uh, I think at this point, though, it's, it's highly unlikely uh, that we're going to solve this issue uh, diplomatically. And in fact, it's really hard to imagine any overlap between what Iran's supreme leader would be willing to agree to in terms of curbs on his uranium enrichment program that would simultaneously reassure Washington and reassure the West that Iran's nuclear program is no longer a problem. Uh, so there have been some signs in recent weeks that uh, we might return to negotiations, but Iran has said that uh, at this point they're unwilling to even discuss uh, curbs on the uranium enrichment program. Uh, so we should hold out the hope that diplomacy and sanctions work, uh, but if that uh, doesn't uh, work out, as I suspect that it won't, that means that the United States could very soon be faced with this difficult decision between uh, simply acquiescing to a nuclear-armed Iran or a military strike to prevent that from happening. Uh, now, a nuclear-armed Iran would pose a grave threat to international peace and security. A uh, nuclear-armed Iran would lead to further proliferation in the Middle East as other countries in the region sought nuclear weapons in response. It will lead to further proliferation around the world as the non-proliferation regime was weakened, as Iran itself becomes a nuclear supplier and provides sensitive nuclear materials and technology to U.S. Uh, adversaries around the world. A nuclear-armed Iran would be more aggressive. Uh, right now, Iran restrains its foreign policy because it fears U.S. retaliation. Uh, but with a nuclear uh, deterrent, uh, it could feel emboldened to push harder, could step up its support to terrorist and proxy groups, engage in more coercive diplomacy in the region. Uh, so this could mean an even more crisis-prone region. Uh, so a crisis-prone region with a nuclear-armed Iran, a nuclear-armed Israel, in the future, perhaps other nuclear-armed states, uh, you know, has a real potential uh, for, for things to go very bad. Um, any one of these crises could become a nuclear crisis, could result in a nuclear exchange. Uh, given Israel's very small size, uh, any one of these uh, crises could very well result in the destruction of the state of Israel. And once Iran has ballistic missiles capable of reaching the east coast uh, of the United States, which experts estimate could be in as little as five years, any one of these crises could very well result in an attack on the U.S. homeland. Uh, so we would put in a deterrence and containment regime to try to deal with these threats. I think we could deal with some of them, but not all of them. Uh, but even with a deterrence and containment regime in place, a nuclear-armed Iran would pose a grave threat. Uh, so President Bush and President Obama didn't agree on a lot, but they agreed uh, that a nuclear-armed Iran was unacceptable. So this leaves uh, the military option. Uh, now, the military option is, is not an attractive one. Uh, there are significant risks to military action. Uh, but that said, I think uh, military action is preferable to simply acquiescing to a nuclear-armed Iran. Uh, a U.S. military strike could almost certainly destroy Iran's key nuclear facilities. Uh, this would set Iran's program back. It's difficult to estimate uh, with any precision, but I would estimate somewhere from uh, three to ten years. But of course, the hope would be that uh, eventually Iran ends up permanently uh, without nuclear weapons. Uh, so this is a significant uh, upside to a strike. Now, there are significant uh, costs uh, as well, uh, but I think that these costs are less severe than many people uh, think they would be. And I also think that the United States could put in place a strategy to mitigate some of the downside risk. Uh, so the biggest and most obvious cost would be uh, Iranian retaliation. And many people assume, uh, I think including Colin, that a U.S. strike would set off a, a, a regional conflagration, a major conflict. Uh, and I just don't think that's the case. If you put yourself uh, in Iran's shoes, it's really hard to imagine, I think, how this becomes uh, a major conflict. Uh, so first, Iran doesn't have great retaliatory options. Iran doesn't have a serious conventional military, as we usually think about it. Instead, they've been investing in these asymmetric capabilities. Uh, so their options would essentially be to sponsor terrorist or proxy attacks, to uh, launch b inaccurate ballistic missiles, or to cause problems uh, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, so those are their options. Then there's a question about uh, what Iran would do. Uh, would they lash out with everything they had, or would they aim for some kind of calibrated response? So again, put yourself in the shoes of the supreme leader. Your primary goal is to make sure that your uh, state and your regime continues to exist. And you wake up one morning and your key nuclear facilities have been destroyed, uh, but your military is intact, your regime's intact. You have your own strategic dilemma. On one hand, you're going to want to strike back to save face. On the other hand, you're not going to want to pick a fight with uh, the one country on Earth that could make sure that your uh, regime comes to an end. 
Uh, so if they strike back, if they don't strike back hard enough, they lose face, but if they strike back too hard, they lose their heads. And I think we know how people uh, think in that situation. So Iran is almost certainly going to aim for some kind of calibrated response. And the United States can play on those uh, fears by uh, clearly communicating a deterrence message to Iran, clearly communicating that we're only interested in the nuclear facilities, not in the regime, uh, that uh, if they engage in uh, some kind of token retaliation, we'd be willing to end the conflict there. But if they strike back uh, too hard, if they, say, conduct terrorist attacks on U.S. soil, if they attempt to close the Strait of Hormuz, then we would respond with a devastating uh, military response. Um, now, Colin goes on to argue that even if Iran shows restraint, that the United States won't, uh, that the United States will keep itching uh, for a bigger fight, because if Iran retaliates at all, we would have to strike back. There would be political pressure on the White House to strike back and because the U.S. military would want to eliminate uh, any possible threats uh, going in, so they would prefer to completely smash uh, the Iranian military first. Um, and so he has uh, important points, but I think that the United States uh, should show restraint in that situation, that we should understand that trading Iran's nuclear facilities, the greatest national security threat to the country in exchange for token retaliation, uh, is worth it. And I think that strategy should uh, dictate dictate uh, tactics, not the reverse, uh, and that we should uh, aim for a limited strike. So there are other potential costs uh, that, again, I think that when compared to a nuclear-armed Iran are uh, uh, less severe than uh, with a nuclear-armed Iran, and that the United States can manage some of those. I'm sure that these are going to come out um, in Q&A. So in short, I think if the United States finds itself in this situation where it has to choose between acquiescing to a nuclear-armed Iran or a preventive military strike, uh, that the United States should conduct a limited strike on Iran's key nuclear facilities, pull back and absorb an inevitable round of retaliation, and then quick to, uh, seek to quickly de-escalate the crisis. Now, um, Colin is going to argue that we have time to make this decision, and uh, I agree with that. I think that we have uh, less time than Colin thinks we do, but we have time. Colin's also going to argue that there are significant risks to military action, and I agree with that also. But I think that unless Colin is willing to argue that a diplomatic breakthrough is just around the corner, or that he would prefer to see a nuclear-armed Iran than to conduct a military strike, that nothing he will say tonight calls into question my conclusion, which is that when compared to the grave threat posed by a nuclear-armed Iran, a strike is the least bad option. Thank you. I was actually second at the at the debate championships, so there are at least several uh, two other people who were uh, finished better than I did. Um, so I'm going to make a, a number of arguments. Uh, basically, I think Matt's arguments follow the decade-old playbook that we saw before the Iraq War, and he follows most of the mistakes. Uh, he exaggerates uh, the threat, posing uh, presenting it as grave and imminent. He exaggerates the benefits of war while downplaying the escalatory risks and spillover effects. He completely ignores post-war scenarios, and he dismisses the prospect of a diplomatic uh, breakthrough just at the moment where negotiations are about to restart. In repeating these mistakes, I'll argue Matt's advocacy uh, risks drawing us down the same road that neoconservatives did uh, more than a decade uh, ago when we went into Iraq, and we saw how that movie ended. Uh, I'm going to make several arguments. Uh, first, uh, the Iranian threat is growing, but it's not yet imminent. U.S. and Israeli intelligence officials have noted that it would take at least a year for Iran to construct a crude, testable device from the point of decision by Iran's uh, supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. It would take several more years after that for Iran to be able to develop a weapon that could be fitted on, on a ballistic missile. Although Iran is clearly positioning itself to develop such a capability, James Clapper, James Clapper, the director of national intelligence, recently testified to the Senate that there's no hard evidence that Khamenei has yet made the final decision to do so, which is very, very uh, important. Moreover, Khamenei is unlikely to do so in the near future, because to generate a bomb any time in the near future will require him to divert stockpiles of low-enriched uranium and use declared enrichment facilities at Natanz and the Fordo enrichment facility near the mountain at Qom, both of which are under IAE inspection, which means he would get caught. And because he doesn't want to get caught, because he knows that that would bring down draconian consequences from the international community, he's likely deterred from going from a bomb anytime soon until he can substantially compress the timeline to, uh, to build a bomb or do it in secret, which means we're probably many years uh, away uh, from that uh, possibility. 
Second, a nuclear-armed Iran would represent a significant challenge uh, to U.S. national security interests, but I think Matt adopts a worst-case assessment of those challenges while adopting a best-case assessment of how the war would actually go. If current sanctions and diplomacy fail, it's still conceivable that Iran may actually settle for a so-called virtual capability as opposed to a fully consummated, fully-fledged nuclear capability. A virtual capability is one in which they would have all the technical components to rapidly construct a weapon, but would actually not do so. The goal would be to generate a minimal deterrent uh, while trying to prevent the international community from coming down uh, too hard uh, on Iran. The outcome would be destabilizing, but hardly the nightmare scenario uh, that, uh, Iran, that uh, Matt portrays. Moreover, even if Iran develops and deploys an actual weapons arsenal, Matt's own writings suggest that they're highly unlikely uh, to use those weapons uh, or to transfer them uh, to terrorist groups. Instead, Matt's major arguments center around uh, Iran being emboldened uh, in the region and the proliferation cascade uh, that would follow from uh, an Iranian weapon. You know, I agree that a nuclear-armed Iran may be further emboldened to use its proxies, particularly groups in the Levant, such as Hezbollah and Palestinian militant groups that threaten Israel. But Iran does that already, and after it acquires a bomb, the regime will have to be more cautious to avoid letting these activities become a direct nuclear crisis with Israel. Thus, the scenarios for escalation that Matt talks about are highly unlikely. You have to remember this. Historically, Iranian adventurism actually reveals a degree of risk aversion. Iran supports proxies and terrorists precisely because it doesn't want a direct confrontation with its adversaries, who are much more powerful than it, the United States and Israel. Right? So their whole purpose of doing this is to avoid direct confrontation with, with, with countries that can end them. Matt agrees that the, that the regime is rational, and Iranian leaders will have a profound, profound interest after acquiring a nuclear weapon of not allowing crises in the Levant or as elsewhere that are by their very nature peripheral to the survival of the regime become nuclear crises that would become intrinsically related to the survival of the regime. It's highly unlikely, even if they become emboldened, that we would see a nuclear crisis uh, emerge. Ironically, Matt's own academic writings also suggest that when crises do occur, they don't escalate, and the, and the countries that tend to win those crises are those that enjoy nuclear superiority and higher resolve, both situations that will, uh, which will uh, define Israel uh, in, most future, uh, in most future scenarios. What about the proliferation cascade? You know, Matt's a proliferation scholar, but apparently he hasn't uh, figured out the fact that there's never actually been a proliferation cascade, ever, to include in the Middle East after Israel supposedly developed its own nuclear weapons uh, in the 1960s. So there's not a lot of history to support the fact that you're going to see this cascade, this chain reaction of nuclear proliferance around the world. The most likely candidate, which Matt will probably talk about, is Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia is a long way away uh, from getting a weapon. Now, they might be able to buy one from Pakistan, but after the AQ Khan fiasco, Pakistan's going to be highly reluctant uh, to give them one. And the Chinese are not going to want to work with, uh, with them to help put a warhead, a, a Pakistani warhead, on the Chinese ballistic missiles that, uh, that the Saudis already have. So the Sa Saudi scenario is also uh, highly unlikely. Other potential proliferants like Egypt and Turkey are even further away uh, than the Saudis. Matt could argue that the, uh, the Iranians will try to back us down from the, in the Gulf, uh, but it's, it's highly uh, unlikely that they'll be able to succeed. Um, after all, North Korea and China both have nuclear weapons, and they haven't been able to push us out of East Asia, at least this last time I checked. Third, Matt's description of a surgical strike uh, on Iran with limited escalation potential is actually a mirage. The type of attack Matt advocates would hit the crown jewel of the regime. It would be very difficult, therefore, to communicate that this wasn't about regime change. All right. Uh, a problem compounded by the fact that there's decades of mutual distrust between the United States and Iran, an Iranian predisposition to see everything we do as about regime change, the lack of reliable communications channel, and the inevitable fog of war. Mutual fears and miscalculations could also lead to rapid escalation. The Iranians will, further, will, will fear that, that further U.S. attacks are imminent, that could decapitate their missile arsenal or their naval capability or their command and control capabilities, which means they will face incentives, very high incentives early in the crisis to use everything they've got in retaliation before they lose them. That's the use them or lose them uh, uh, possibility. Moreover, the United States will also face incentives pr for preemption. At the very least, Iran is going to do a bunch of things. They're going to activate their integrated air defense network. They're going to start dispersing their fast attack craft. They're going to start dispersing their submarines. They're going to start moving their mines out of storage. All of those things would represent huge threats to the United States forces in the region and uh, to international shipping. 
and the United States will have an incentive early in the crisis to cripple those capabilities before they can do much damage. Moreover, the types of proxy attacks that Matt is talking about could result in the deaths of dozens of U.S. diplomats in places like Afghanistan, many troops uh, in Afghanistan or against U.S. facilities uh, in the Gulf, and it is inconceivable in an election year that that wouldn't drag the United States into uh, an escalated uh, conflict. Fourth, a surgical attack along the lines that Matt advocates would not buy much time and could actually make the nuclear challenge worse. A near-term attack on Iran's nuclear program would knock it back by at most a few years. Meanwhile, it would motivate Iran's hardliners to do a bunch of things, kick out IAEA inspectors, it would likely settle the internal debate within the regime about whether the, uh, Iran needed a nuclear deterrent, and it would incentivize the regime to rapidly rebuild a clandestine nuclear infrastructure. Consequently, in the aftermath of the strike, Washington would have to encircle Iran with a costly containment regime, much like we had to do for 12 years after the 1991 Gulf War with Saddam, and be prepared to reattack at a moment's notice to prevent the Iranians from reconstituting their program. A unilateral U.S. strike would also shatter the international consensus and allow Tehran to play the victim, making containment after the strike extraordinarily difficult and leaving Washington to bear the burden alone. And once the IAEA is kicked out, we wouldn't even be able to know the degree to which uh, they were reconstituting their program, let alone take action against it. So Matt's going to try to set up this false choice between living with a nuclear Iran or striking them. But you know what? Striking them is the clearest route uh, to Iran developing a nuclear weapon. All right. The resolution, by the way, is unconditional. It says you should strike now to ensure that Iran does not uh, develop a nuclear weapon. Well, a strike doesn't ensure that Iran doesn't develop a nuclear weapon. In fact, it's most likely to have the opposite uh, outcome. Fortunately, uh, we still have time for other options. Washington-backed pressure measures are starting to bite. The Iranian economy is struggling under sanctions, and Iranian leaders have signaled their willingness to come back to the negotiating table. We need to take a collective breath in this town and let this process play out. A diplomatic solution that provides sufficient assurances against weaponization efforts while respecting Iranian rights under the MPT will be difficult to achieve. But unlike military action, it is the only sustainable solution to an enduring outcome. Military action should remain an option. Indeed, a credible background threat is important for diplomacy. But framing the issue the way Matt does simultaneously hypes the near-term threat and dismisses any prospect for a diplomatic outcome which narrows rather than expands the space for a lasting solution that ensures an end to Iran's nuclear ambitions. In closing, Iran is not very close to a bomb. The, the, the crisis itself would be extraordinarily difficult to manage. In addition to all the risks that I pointed out, there are all sorts of instability risks as it relates to expansion of the conflict in the Levant, instability in the context of the Arab Spring. There are a lot of reasons why now is not a very good time. That's the, uh, that's the nuclear clock. <laughs> In any case, uh, I, I, uh, if you agree with, uh, with what I've said, then I would ask you to uh, vote negative. OK, great. So I think it's my turn to uh, ask Colin a few questions before we uh, open it up to everyone else, or um, before he asks me some questions and we open it up. Um, so, Colin, I mean, I, you know, I've read your foreign affairs article with, with great interest. We debated this issue uh, last week at, at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, as I said in the beginning, I think we have uh, some time uh, before we have to make this decision. But I'm, I'm still not sure what your bottom line is on this key question, which is uh, if we get to the point of having to, to strike or not, uh, what you would recommend. So let me just ask directly, if, if President Obama called you today and said that he just received credible intelligence that Iran was enriching, enriching uranium to 90 percent, and he wants to know whether he should begin the process of building domestic international support for a strike or begin the process of deterring and containing a nuclear-armed Iran, what would you advise? Well, I'm going to actually answer that in, in two respects. The first is to, uh, I, I hate to do this to you, man, but to pull a, a little bit of a debater's trick. Um, the resolution actually doesn't say, if X, Y, or Z happens, then we should consider military action against Iran. It's unconditional. So to vote affirmative means that you're confident enough that, that diplomacy has failed, that sanctions have failed, that we should take military action. If you don't believe that, if you have some uncertainty, if you believe that we can wait, then that's an argument against the resolution, not an argument in favor of it. So let's be uh, uh, clear about that. Uh, I didn't write the resolution. I'm just, I'm just here performing. Uh, <laughs> 
to answer your question, you know, if I got the call, I, first of all, I, he's highly unlikely to call me, uh, <laughs> especially if he watches the YouTube clips. Uh, here. I think a lot of it would depend on the context, uh, frankly. Uh, not all of the red lines uh, that you have discussed in other contexts, I think, are actual red lines. I think there are some things they could do uh, that would be particularly troubling. If they kicked out the IAEA, uh, that would be bad. Uh, if they uh, took steps to pr uh, start producing weapons-grade uranium, that would obviously uh, be bad. Uh, if, they, if we had evidence that they were reconstituting a structured weaponization program or we discovered a wholly operational covert enrichment facility, these would all, I think, uh, raise some very, very tough choices uh, for the president. But, you know, a bunch of questions would have to be asked. How compelling is the evidence? What are the prospects for forging an international coalition and building regional support? Uh, what can be done ahead of time to mitigate the consequences? Uh, what diplomatic ste steps uh, have been taken? Is there a non-overt option of accomplishing the same uh, objectives while minimizing some of the downside risks? All of this, I think, would affect the risk-reward ra ratio and therefore what I would recommend. Uh, and since I don't know the values of any of these future variables today, and neither do you, frankly, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't unconditionally endorse a strike. Uh, which means that I, I, I think you still basically end up voting negative. Okay. So what I hear is you're unwilling to take a stand on the really important <laughs> question that the country's uh, about to face. But uh, I'll, I'll go to the, the next question. Um, so you've said, you said in your introduction that we have a lot of time, that Iran isn't close to building a nuclear weapon, and you, uh, you know, I think we agree that uh, the first step would be enriching to higher levels. Uh, David Albright's new report that came out last week says that Iran could now uh, produce enough uh, highly enriched uranium for its first bomb in, in four months after deciding to do so. Uh, I think that's the relevant timeline. But you've said that the relevant timeline is actually years, because even once they had the material, it would take time to make a bomb, it would take time to put it on a warhead, it would take time to deliver it, etc. So if all that uh, stuff, that years-long timeline that you lay out, lay out is really relevant to the military option, uh, could you answer uh, if Iran gets enough material for a weapon, kicks out inspectors, and moves the material to some undisclosed location, what military option you would recommend to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons? Well, if the scenario is premised on them having a bunch of undisclosed locations, then your solution of bombing their overt facilities doesn't help us out uh, very much. No, uh, it's not premised on that. Right. So let's get the timelines right. Our intelligence officials have said a year. That year is comprised of two things. One is how much time it would take for them to enrich their stockpile of low-enriched uranium to a weapons grade level. The standard assessment is six to seven months. If they acquire enough 20% enrichment uh, for one bomb, that, that could be cut uh, dramatically. Uh, but, it's what, but here's what's really important. They'd have to use Natanz or Fordo to do that, and they'd get caught, right? Which means, A, they're li not likely to do it because they'd get caught, and B, if they got caught, there would be time uh, to respond. The year, however, is the time it would take them to construct a device. So even if they could generate weapons-grade uranium in a couple of months, it would still take them a year, based on our intelligence estimates, to generate a device. That's a long time uh, to go after their uh, facilities, and the United States has a lot of capabilities. Um, so you said uh, six months. David Albright came out with a new report uh, last uh, week that suggested it's uh, four months. But um, you know, I, th I think that uh, you agree with my point, which is that we can bomb uh, facilities. The military option is relevant once they're producing material in facilities. Once they have the material, the only thing that can uh, stop them is a, is a ground invasion. So this time to build uh, a weapon is really irrelevant to this question about Actually, the only force. way to stop them, period, would be an invasion and occupation. Uh, the only military option that ensures an end to their program is one you don't advocate. And that is the invasion and occupation of Iran. The resolution calls for you to ensure the end of Iran's program. Surgical strikes don't ensure that. All surgical strikes do is motivate them to go all the way to a, to a bomb. The only way to ensure it is to invade them, occupy them, and change the regime. So if you're prepared to advocate that, that's in a completely uh, uh, a different debate. But I, I think you know we'd have to have Jamie Fly on that side of the table, I think, to, to uh, have that argument. All right. Um, now you have five minutes to ask him questions. Oh, interesting. OK. Uh, I had some questions here. I know I did. All right. So I guess the question would be, uh, we, could, we could turn it around a little bit. Um, are there circumstances in which you would not endorse a military strike? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think um, the answer, the short answer is yes. And, um, you know, I think uh, a lot of people assume things about my article from the title, uh, the Foreign Affairs article, which was very provocative, Time to Attack Iran. Uh, but 
what I really argue is that if Iran crosses, uh, I mean, I can, let me uh, actually quote myself here. Um, uh, so, page 77, quote, if Iran expels International Atomic Energy Agency inspectors, begins enriching its stockpiles of uranium to weapons grade levels of 90%, or installs advanced centrifuges at its uranium enrichment facility in Qom, the United States must strike immediately or forfeits its last opportunity to prevent Iran from joining the nuclear club. So as I said at the beginning, I'd be absolutely delighted if we could get some kind of diplomatic settlement to this. If we just got word that Iran gave up its enrichment program, I think we'd all go out uh, and celebrate. Um, so if they stop short or if they roll back their nuclear program, I don't think we should use force. But if they continue down this path, if they cross these red lines, uh, then I think that the United States should use force to stop them from weaponizing. So I guess the question then, does, does the resolution ask you if X, Y, and Z happens, then we should use military force? Or does it say we should use military force? Well, I guess I'm going to uh, lose the debate here. I, I didn't realize the debate started when we were negotiating over the, the resolution. I needed, a, a, a better, uh, <laughs> I needed a better a better lawyer at that point. The question I'm interested in, in answering is, um, you know, again, if sanctions and diplomacy fail, and if the United States uh, has to make this decision yeah, between no, striking I, I, or rolling I, I, over, I, I, that, I, I, that I we should that. Uh, strike. I get that. Okay. Um, so flesh out for me, again, how a scenario happens in which an Iran with nuclear weapons finds itself in a nuclear war with, with Israel. Uh, I mean, they don't border one another. They're relatively uh, far away from each other. So ostensibly, it's because Iran's emboldened use of proxy. So you have a repeat of the 2006 Lebanon war, but this time there's the shadow of an Iranian nuclear bomb in the background. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's that's basically right. I mean, I think uh, you know, th you know, the United States wasn't a suicidal state, but we were willing to risk nuclear war a number of times uh, during the Cold War over uh, things that, in, in hindsight, might you know, not seem uh, to have been worth but, risking okay, but nuclear war over. So I, I think that that's in well, that's interesting though, because your own academic work suggests that <laughs> that in the history of nuclear crises, countries that enjoy nuclear superiority and higher resolve, both of which will define Israel in these equations, back down their opponents. Why would Iran, which you agree is rational, even transform a future Lebanon war into a nuclear crisis? By its nature, these crises are peripheral to uh, Iran's interests. Why would the regime risk annihilation for peripheral interests? Uh, well, two, uh, two, two responses to that. The first is that I think many um, people um, you know, don't, don't fully understand nuclear deterrence theory. Many people think that nuclear deterrence ends with mutually assured destruction, that you know, two countries have nuclear weapons, a nuclear war would be bad, so international politics is over. Uh, nuclear deterrence actually begins with mutually assured destruction. Nuclear armed states still have conflicts of interest. They still try to coerce each other. Uh, and the question is, how do they do that? There's a large uh, scholarly and policy literature on this. Uh, Thomas Schelling uh, proposed one answer, which is they make a threat that leaves something to chance. They engage in a process, the nuclear crisis. They purposely raise the risk of nuclear war, uh, play these high-stakes games of nuclear chicken, trying to coerce their adversary into backing down. So I think it's very likely that Iran and Israel, Iran and the United States, Iran and other adversaries are going to find these, these are going to have conflicts of interest, are going to threaten nuclear war as a way to, to try to coerce each other. And in that crisis type uh, situation, things could spin out of control. Well, let me, let me, I'll conclude, I guess, you know, you quoted yourself. Let me quote you back to yourself. You know, in a, in a future article you have coming out on an international organization, you say, proliferation in Iran would disadvantage the United States by forcing it to compete with Iran in risk taking. On the other hand, the findings of this article also suggest that the United States would fare well in future nuclear crises. As long as the United States maintains nuclear superiority over Iran, a prospect that seems highly likely in the years to come, Washington will frequently be able to achieve its basic goals in nuclear confrontations with Iran. I, I didn't write that. You did. Uh, I mean, I get it that nuclear crises are a game of risks, but why would Iran take risks in a crisis with Israel far away that's peripheral to its interests and isn't risk, risking annihilation of the regime? Or why would it succeed in those risk-taking encounters with the United States when you've concluded in other forums that it actually the United States would, would triumph? Well, so the article Colin uh, cited is coming out in a nerdy peer review uh, journal. So let me just uh, translate in, into uh, plain English. So what I uh, so first of all, when we are assessing the threat of a nuclear armed Iran, we need to consider many possible uh, effects on U.S. interests, including nuclear proliferation, uh, Iran being emboldened, stepped up to support to terrorists, all the stuff I talked about before. One thing to consider is how it affects nuclear war and, and nuclear crises and course of bargaining. So what I find in this uh, article. Uh, what I say is that the United States will be better off if Iran doesn't uh, acquire nuclear weapons first. 
um, because the United States now has nuclear and conventional superiority over Iran, can uh, use that as a course of advantage. If Iran gets nuclear weapons, however, it would transform U.S.-Iranian competition into these high-stakes games of nuclear chicken. So that's bad. Uh, second, I say that the United States and Iran would find themselves in Cuban Missile Crisis type situations. That's also bad. Third, I say that you know, from my uh, study of nuclear crises from 1945 to the present, that countries with a nuclear advantage over their opponent are more likely to achieve their goals. And in the past, what I found is that of the 52 crisis participants, uh, just over half the time, the country with more nuclear weapons got its way. So this suggests that in crises between the United States and Iran, just over half the time, the United States would achieve its basic goals as long as the crisis doesn't end in nuclear war. Uh, so if that's uh, reassuring to uh, anyone, I think you're uh, much more relaxed than I am. I, I take the findings of that article as, as bad news for Iranian proliferation. Did any of not those 52 news. conflict dyads in your article escalate? Any of them? Um, it's a yes, no question. The answer is no, right? The answer is no, but I think, you no, know. But, I mean, I know what you think. You just explain what you think. But there were 52 conflict dyads, some 20-odd nuclear crises in the last 60 years. None of them escalated, right? I think it's naive to think that nuclear weapons will never be used again just because they haven't been used in 60 years. And I think the more countries that have nuclear weapons, uh, especially in crisis-prone regions like the Middle East, uh, the more likely okay, we are so to have a nuclear to, catastrophe. You're willing, so if, at the bottom line, you're willing to roll the dice and guarantee a destabilizing outcome for a military strike that may not be necessary, uh, hedging against the possibility of something happening that's never happened before, right? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. um, I, I think that, that a strike is the, the, the consequences of a strike uh, w would be less bad than the consequences of dealing with a nuclear armed Iran for years, decades, maybe even longer to come. All right. Um, we got to move to the next section. Um, so I just have a couple of questions for each of you, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, so my first question is for you, um, Matt. We talked a little bit earlier. Um, about the ability of a strike to kind of limit the damage at the outset of retaliation and things like that, um, an escalation because the United States would be able to clearly communicate to Iran. I think the phrase, yeah, use clearly communicate to Iran. They are, we are only interested in striking their nuclear facilities, um, but not interested in things like regime change. Um, and Colin kind of touched on this a little bit in um, his opening remarks, but if it's true that one of the reasons why Iran getting the nuclear, a nuclear weapon would be bad is because miscalculation and miscommunication is likely, and those types of deterrence failures are likely, why would the United States, or how, I guess, would the United States be able to clearly communicate to Iran that we are not interested in taking out their regime so that they would not escalate their response? Um, no, it's an excellent question. So I don't think that a nuclear-armed Iran would be bad because of, of miscommunica miscommunication, per se, as I laid out. I, th I think there are a lot of things that could go wrong with a nuclear-armed Iran. And I think the, the risk of nuclear war could happen as a result of these nuclear crises as countries are trying to coerce each other. And, and I don't think that uh, mis miscommunication is, is necessarily an important part of that. Uh, but I, I do think that um, the United States could communicate to Iran that we have limited aims. I mean, in the run-up to any kind of uh, conflict like this, the United States you know, the United States would do this very differently than Israel would do it. Israel's done uh, kind of preventive strikes on nuclear facilities like this in, in the middle of the night. Uh, the United States wouldn't do that. We would clearly try to build international support before. There would be a number of presidential statements about our interests. So I think, you know, Iran is going to pay attention to that. So I think that if we're very clear in our public statements that we're only interested in destroying the nuclear facilities, not in a broader conflict, uh, we have uh, various back channels through which we can communicate to Iran. We can use those back channels. Uh, and then we can communicate through our targeting. If we're, we go after the, the key nuclear facilities and the air defenses necessary to get there, but we're not targeting uh, the uh, you know, government offices, we're not targeting command and control centers, uh, I think Iran uh, would get the message. And you know, Collins' uh, scenario under which this leads to uh, Iran just saying they have nothing left to lose and lashing out with everything they have assumes that Iran is going to commit national suicide, essentially, uh, if we uh, strike their key nuclear facilities. I, I just think that's, that's unrealistic. Their primary goal is to uh, survive. If we bomb their key nuclear facilities, that's clearly bad for them. I think it is the crown jewel of the regime, as, as Colin said. But again, they still have their military. They still have the regime. I don't see why they would voluntarily pick a uh, fight with the world's biggest superpower after that. Um, but just to be clear, you do think that we would have to initiate some sort of military action to clearly communicate to, that, to them? Because I mean, you mentioned we could also use public statements, but the United States now says all options are on the table. Obama says, I do not bluff. Uh, those things seem like him attempting to clearly communicate a threat. So why is that not sufficient to 
deter them if it's that's the case that they're not suicidal. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think if I under so I'm, what I'm talking about here is communicating what type of, of force we would use well, if just, we decided to use force. Do we have so. to use force at all to communicate to convince Iran that the United States is not interested in regime change? Uh, is it possible that we could do that purely by threatening to do so? I mean, you, you mentioned, you, I guess I should re-clarify. So one of the reasons, at least in your article, for why, um, why, the, why a strike could be limited in the fallout is that the United States would be able to both demonstrate restraint on its own and it would be able to, you know, convince Iran to calibrate its response. And I'm wondering if you, I guess, could just go more in depth about what kinds of things the United States would do to get Iran to calibrate its response such that, it, you know, uh, Colin mentioned, use it or lose it pressures that the Iranian regime would feel, especially if there are already tensions with the United States over other things like um, the Strait of Hormuz, what sorts of things the United States would have to do to resolve those pressures that it would feel? Yeah. Um, well, f first, so Colin's use it or lose it idea was that Iran would, would shoot off all of its ballistic missiles uh, right away to make sure that we uh, didn't uh, destroy them. Um, and I, I guess that's possible. I, I think it's unlikely for, for two reasons. First, as I pointed out, I think uh, Iran uh, isn't going to want to make this a, a bigger fight than they need to. Um, it, again, I, they, they don't want the regime to come to an end. They know that picking a big fight with the United States could very well mean the end of the regime. And the second is that they uh, are going to have to save military capabilities for a future conflict. Uh, they can't um, expend all of their military capabilities. In this conflict, they're going to want to save something back uh, for deterrence and uh, for future conflicts. Uh, so I think it's unrealistic that they would shoot off uh, all their ballistic missiles. And they, they only have a limited number of launchers, so it would actually take them um, quite a bit of time to, to go through their uh, inventory. Um, but in terms of your uh, question of communication, I, I, we would communicate that again through public statements and through targeting. We would say we're using military force to um, you know, enforce these United Nations Security Council resolutions for now, which demand that Iran suspend its uranium enrichment work. Iran is in, uh, you know, uh, ignoring those Security Council resolutions. We're going to use force against the nuclear facilities to enforce those. Uh, and that is the end of our objective. Um, and uh, Iran, um, you know, uh, we can keep this a limited conflict. But if Iran wants to retaliate and close the Strait of Hormuz, launch major terrorist attacks in the United States, then uh, we can respond with a larger uh, uh, a larger conflict if they want to make it one. But I think we communicate through the targeting and, and through public messaging. Um, okay, one last question for you. Uh, so there's a, there was a little bit of discussion earlier about the distinction between a strike being able to delay Iran obtaining a nuclear capability versus eradicating it uh, entirely. Um, and so you even mentioned that, you know, it's possible it could only at best delay Iran's nuclear capability. But um, how does that you know, in, in a scenario in which the United States does strike them and perhaps it does only delay them because it doesn't eliminate that latent nuclear knowledge or even the ability to build new centrifuges, what does the United States have to do in that post-strike sort of preventative plan to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon? So, so I do think that, uh, you know, it's possible that this a strike would merely kick the can down the road. I, I think that there are also a good reason to believe that it could become uh, permanent, however. I think it's possible that Iran would give up in the aftermath of a strike. Uh, Colin and others assume that Iran would double down and rebuild its nuclear facilities quickly, and that's possible. It's also possible that they would give up, that we've been working on this expensive nuclear infrastructure for decades. It's now completely destroyed. Are we really going to spend another decade rebuilding only to invite a future military attack? Um, buying time is good in and of itself, I think. If we have to deal with a nuclear-armed Iran, I would rather deal with it in 10 years than next year. Um, the strike buys space for something to happen, something else to happen where Iran ends up permanently without nuclear weapons, maybe an indigenous regime change, maybe uh, some other conventional conflict that prevents Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, uh, buys further time for diplomacy. And I think that a strike could also change the bargaining space for diplomacy. Uh, so I think there are certain things with a strike that make diplomacy harder, but I think there are also things that could make it easier. I think if I were the supreme leader, I'd be much more willing to trade away a shattered nuclear program than one that was within months of giving me a, a coveted nuclear weapon. Uh, so I think there are reasons to believe that a strike could lead to Iran that's permanently without nuclear weapons. If all we do, though, is, is kick the can uh, down the road, uh, then, um, you know, I think the way we would deal with it would, would depend on uh, the circumstances at the time. Um, but I think we would want to use that space uh, for diplomacy. I think we would want to use that space to uh, pressure um, uh, the regime to uh, support opposition movements. I think we would want to um, use that space to uh, 
put a containment regime in place. Colin, Colin argues that the containment regime after a strike would be the same as if Iran had nuclear weapons, uh, and I, I think that's misleading. Clearly, the commitments with a nuclear armed Iran would be much greater. We'd be talking about extending the nuclear umbrella to Saudi, to Gulf states, to uh, Israel, to other countries in the region. We'd be talking about forward deploying U.S. nuclear weapons on the territory of those countries to make the threat to trade Riyadh for New York credible. Uh, so these would this would be a massive military political uh, increase in U.S. military and political commitments in the region. Uh, so I think the containment costs are clearly uh, much higher on the side of a nuclear-armed Iran than they are uh, in a post-strike environment. Thanks. Um, okay, for Colin, I have a couple questions for you as well. Um, so I know you kind of backed away from answering this earlier because it may or may not fall within what you're supposed to defend for the resolution, but just for kind of the sake of discussion, um, you, you talked about uh, some scenarios under which it might be possible for the United States, or a good idea even, for the United States to have to execute a strike. And I was wondering if you could speak to the question of Israeli strikes and, you know, how do you think the United States should respond if it becomes the case that Israel, and an Israeli strike is in fact imminent, if that changes the calculation um, in kind of any of the scenarios that you outlined? Well, look, um, Matt and I have done this before. I think the one thing we will definitely agree on is that uh, if if anybody's to go after the Iranian program militarily, it should be the United States. Uh, an Israeli strike is a disastrous uh, proposal uh, because it generates most of the downside risks of a strike with almost none of the benefits. Uh, the Israeli military capabilities are a fraction. As, prof as profound as they are, they are a fraction of U.S. Uh, military capabilities. The Israelis would have to travel about 1,200 miles to hit, uh, you know, half a dozen or a dozen uh, sites, many of them uh, extraordinarily hardened. Some of them Israeli weapons probably couldn't do much uh, damage to, and they'd have to do it in a single day, a single strike, then race back before they ran out of fuel to defend Israel against the inevitable rocket attacks from Hamas, which they're dealing with as we speak, uh, Hezbollah, uh, and other groups. The United States would have the ability to do a lengthy campaign and has much more formidable military capabilities. So an Israeli strike is just a bad idea. Um, you know, I, I, I think President Obama said during the, uh, during, when he was a candidate for election that he wasn't against all wars, he was just against dumb wars. Uh, an Israeli preventive war in Iran is a dumb war. Uh, I, I don't know if, if folks uh, saw Amir Dagan's uh, interview on, uh, on uh, 60 Minutes uh, the other day, but he made a pretty compelling case uh, in exactly the same dimension, and that guy's no dove uh, on Iran. Uh, so uh, in any case, um, I think an Israeli strikes are a, a very bad idea. Now the question would, it would become what should the U.S. posture be if the Israelis do strike? Sure. I think a lot of it would depend on the nature of Iranian retaliation, frankly. Um, uh, so, I, I mean, I know, I, look, I know that it frustrates people when you say it depends, but that's because I'm not willing to make a certain, certain advocacy for going to war in the absence of knowing precisely the scenario under which uh, I would make that recommendation. I actually that's, I think that's a huge difference between uh, Matt and I. I'm just a lot less confident in the calculus which is, I think, a good thing. I think the experience of, of Iraq, where we lost 4,500 servicemen and, and women and spent a trillion dollars for a quest, for questionable gain, uh, su suggests that we better be damned confident uh, about launching another one of these things before, before we do it. So I don't, it would depend, in the context of Israel, about what the Iranians did. I think if the Iranians retaliated uh, full bore against the United States in the aftermath of an Israeli strike, uh, then you know, the United States needs to punch them back in the mouth. One of the, one of the things that I think actually <laughs> Uh, Matt made reference to this. I think it's just because we've had this conversation back and forth. Um, I think actually Matt's suggestion is a lot closer to the reason why the Israeli strike is a bad idea in the sense that it's a pinprick surgical strike. When I actually think if you're going to do a military campaign against the Iranians, you punch them so hard so they don't get back up. Uh, uh, it's the only way probably to compel uh, an, an outcome. Uh, but Matt's not comfortable with advocating that position, so he ends up in this kind of bizarro Goldilocks situation of not hot enough, not cold enough, just wrong. He it advocates a strike that's just enough to piss the Iranians off, wound them, and leave them motivated to go for a nuclear bomb. That's the worst outcome, and certainly not as the resolution advocates the type of military action that would ensure uh, that Iran doesn't get a uh, nuclear weapon. So while an Israeli strike is the worst option, Matt's option's a close second worst. Um, so kind of a follow-up question to that, so clearly you've made your views on surgical strikes clear, but I was wondering if you would talk more about, not that you have to defend this, but what, what kind of scenario would the United States, if forced to execute a strike, be most likely to be successful in, at least if not halting, delaying Iran's nuclear capability? 
So if, if I was arguing Matt's case, how well, would I not, try to make it better? Not uh, necessarily, but you, you seem to mention a lot that a full-scale invasion you know, look, I would think be some effective. people Some people have tried to outflank. You know, Matt's been caught in a little bit of a circular firing squad in Washington, right? He's gotten, he's, he's gotten attacked by folks uh, like me, but he's also got uh, attacked by folks on the right who believe that he doesn't go far enough because he hasn't called for military regime change. Military imposed regime change in Iran wouldn't work, uh, and most likely, and, and you'd get into the you know breaking Humpty Dumpty and being responsible for picking up all the pieces uh, uh, problem. What I would I think if you're going to do military action, what I mean by punch them so hard that they don't get up is you have to hold the regime at risk. In other words, Matt's surgical strike is precisely aimed not at holding the regime at risk, so that it doesn't retaliate. But the cost of that is by not holding the regime at risk, you can't compel them to, to uh, abandon their nuclear program. Now, I think, by the way, military action is not the right answer, certainly not the right answer at the moment. But if you're going to do it, you shouldn't go half seas, right? You need to, uh, uh, you need to uh, you know, jump into the deep end of the pool. Okay. Um, we're going to open up questions to the audience now. Um, we have people walking around with microphones, so please wait to ask your question until you get a microphone. And when you do, state your name and affiliation, and please try to keep it to one question. So, right there. Hi, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. There's one aspect that you, neither of you has really touched on, and I'd like both of you to address this. That is that an attack on Iran's nuclear facilities, however surgical, would kill lots of Iranians, would release uh, materials that are toxic, radioactive, that could kill lots more Iranians. Given the state of the U.S. image in the region now, and I'm thinking particularly of what's going on in Afghanistan, is it really in the United States' interest to attack preemptively another Muslim country? Wouldn't that just unify the entire region where the United States is already not that popular against us, and wouldn't that have far worse consequences than whatever pyrrhic gains you might get from hitting uh, Iranian nuclear facilities? Thank you. Well, I think um, you know, the U.S. image is is one um, you know potential factor to consider uh, when when considering military uh, action. I think um, you know, you're absolutely right that there are many people who are going to respond negatively to this. Uh, I do think that there are things that the United States uh, can do and will do, though, to, to try to mitigate that to some degree. So as I said before, uh, the United States would do this very differently than Israel would. Uh, we wouldn't do a, a bolt out of the blue strike in the middle of the night. Uh, we would work in advance to try to build uh, international support uh, for action. Uh, I think we could maybe even try to table a uh, UN Security Council resolution. The Chinese and the Russians would almost certainly veto it. Um, but I think that we could build a, a coalition. I think we could certainly get uh, the Brits, uh, maybe the French, uh, other NATO allies. Um, and I, I don't know that we would get public uh, support from, from Arab countries, but I think that we would get uh, private support. And I mean, we've seen that um, leaders in, in Saudi Arabia have asked the United States to, quote, cut the head off the snake. Uh, so they might uh, condemn us in public, but uh, congratulate us uh, behind closed doors. Um, so I agree that that's uh, one potential risk, but I think when we're talking about, you know, one of the greatest national security threats uh, to the country, that that um, is uh, perhaps weighing the, the cost and benefits, one cost that's uh, willing, that I would be willing to absorb in order to, uh, to reduce uh, the security threat to the United States. You know, Barbara's question wasn't what you'd be willing to absorb. It's, what, it's how much damage to civilians we're willing to inflict. Um, I, and I, look, I, we can't kid ourselves. This is not a small, neat, this isn't a game where you have pieces on a, on, a, on a board. You can anticipate every counter move and you cleverly move your pieces around to mitigate the consequences. This is going to be confusing, messy, violent, and completely unpredictable. But the one thing we can predict is that people are going to die and potentially large numbers of people are going to die. Now, it depends. I don't, you know, I'm not a nuclear scientist. I couldn't tell you about the fallout or other things. But if you start going after targets like centrifuge production facilities, which are in downtown Tehran, okay, you're going to kill a lot of people. So let's, let's make that clear. Okay, if you believe that we should rush into military action, you're making a decision to kill a lot of people. All right? Now, there may be an argument to do it or not to do it, but we shouldn't pretend that this is some antiseptic exercise. Okay? This is, this is real, and there are real uh, people's uh, lives at stake. Uh, the consequences for the region, Barbara, I think, you know, it's one thing I wish I had more time to talk about, but I'm glad you actually gave me the opportunity. Look, the region is going through, let's just say, an interesting time. 
Matt is right that, that behind closed doors, uh, you know, some folks in Abu Dhabi or Riyadh might uh, clap or say nothing uh, uh, if the United States uh, did it, but the Arab street would not react that way. Uh, this would give Islamists and besieged elites who are searching for populist messages to bolster their case in the context of the Arab Spring. Never has the Arab Spring mattered more than today. It would give them a lot of ammunition to turn the, the, the narrative about the Arab Spring, which is very much about an intra-Arab conversation, into an anti-American one and an anti-Israeli one. And it would inflame the worst impulses of those who would uh, want to do us harm. It's not in our interest. Ironically, we, we're at a time in the region where Iran's closest ally in the region, Bashar al-Assad in, in Syria, is wobbling. Hezbollah is defensive. Hamas doesn't know which way to turn. This is the worst time to give Iran a gift. And don't and 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 and, and believe me, what Matt is suggesting gives them a gift, because it allows them to play the victim by saying they got attacked, and through their retaliation against the United States, which Matt admits is inevitable at some level, it allows the Iranians to do something that they really want, which is to rejuvenate their street cred on the Arab street as the champion of resistance in this part of the world. If you look at opinion polls in the Middle East, Iran has taken the hugest hit during the Arab Spring. Three years ago, they were above 60% approval in most Arab countries. Today, they are not above 20% in any country but Lebanon. They are getting slaughtered on the soft power scores at the moment. You let them play the victim, you let them rejuvenate their resistance credibility, and that is a gift, a gift to this regime. James. Um, James Ackham, Carnegie Endowment. Um, I agree with Colin that it would be very, very hard to convince Iran that you're only engaged in limited strikes. But for the sake of argument, let's assume that Colin is wrong and that you really can send out a signal that this strike was limited. Um, you argue that Iran would be deterred from responding. But isn't there another possibility? which is that the Ayatollah sits there and he thinks, well, the US went into Libya with limited aims uh, and deposed Gaddafi. And the US went into Iraq in 91 with limited aims and ended up deposing Saddam. So because even if this strike was limited, the next strike won't be limited and they're gonna come for me, the Ayatollah. And if he thinks down that line, then the logical thing to do is to try to deter the US from coming after the regime which presumably you do with a big asymmetric response to convince the US that if they come after the regime, there will be another big asymmetric response. In other words, uh, Iranian, big Iranian retaliation is necessary for them to, to, to develop the credibility of their deterrence against regime change. So given that, how are you so confident that the Ayatollah is going to decide, oh, it, because it was only a limited strike, they're not going to come for me in future, and therefore I'm not going to retaliate big style. Yeah, it's, it's a, a clever question. I hope you're not uh, advising the Supreme Leader. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that's a possibility, but I, th I think, again, given the, the stakes involved, given what we think Iran's... Um, primary goal is, is it's the uh, continued existence of, of the current theocratic regime. I think that we've seen, uh, despite all the inflammatory rhetoric, that um, since 1979 they've had a, a fairly pragmatic uh, foreign policy, uh, that they you know, uh, do what they can to make sure that they uh, continue to exist. So you might be right that they might think that, well, the United States says this is limited, but it's, but it's actually going to be more. Um, but if we tell them very clearly that if they engage in certain forms of retaliation, that it will certainly become much more, and his inclination is going in, in that direction anyway, I think that that uh, would um, deter him, you know, given that, you know, if he thinks that it's likely that we're going to respond in a big way, we tell him if he crosses these lines, we will certainly respond in a big way. And given uh, his inherent pragmatism and desire to exist, I think he's going to refrain from crossing those lines. Uh, Mike Gerson from the Center for Naval Analyses. Um, so if you look at just your foreign affairs articles back to back, it seems like the debate is to attack or not to attack. But really it seems like really what's driving this debate and what underpins it is the cost of attack versus the cost of a containment and deterrence regime. That seems to be the, the, the two options, that's the real debate. So I'm just curious if I could sort of ask both of you sort of a counterfactual, which is to say that in the, late, in the mid to late 1940s and even into the 1950s, I've sort of been struck by the seriousness with which the United States considered 
in the, in the run-up to a Soviet acquisition of atomic capability, a preventive strike. And even in the early 1950s, when that capability was extremely rudimentary, and, that, and, and for that matter, ours was as well, the serious considerations all the way up to, the, to Truman and then to Eisenhower about preventive war. So given sort of what we know now about what that, what that, what, how that played out and the extended deterrence commitments and everything else we did to deter and contain the Soviet Union, at that period of time back then, would either of you have advocated for uh, a preventive war, a preventive strike against the Soviet Union? Do you want to go first, Colin? I've been talking about that lately. You know, I, I, I don't know. I wasn't alive then. Uh, I think one thing we need to be cautious about, though, is comparing a nuclear Iran to the Soviet Union. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, I know you're not, but you're asking to draw a, a, a parallel about, about conclusions about a preventive strike or not a, not a strike or containment and deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iran as, as it relates to uh, the Soviet Union. It's just, an, they're, they're apples and oranges. So I don't know what I would have advised in the 1950s. I do know what I would advise now, which is that a strike has a lot of downside risk, and as a result, we should push the decision about it as far into the future uh, as, as possible. I do think uh, there are some important differences. You know, you mentioned extended deterrence uh, uh, regimes. You know, during the Cold War, it was difficult to uh, credibly commit to trade, you know, Boston for Berlin, right? That's the standard uh, point. You know, with Iran, in, in the context of an extended, extending U.S. nuclear umbrella over countries like Israel and, and Saudi Arabia, it would be a little bit different. I mean, in some ways, it would be the same. We'd be easily be able to convey that countries like Israel and Saudi Arabia are central to vital U.S. national interests, right? If Iran nuked Saudi Arabia, it would be catastrophic to the U.S. Uh, economy. So the United States has an interest in the security of, of Saudi Arabia. And raise your hand if you think that if Iran nuked Israel, there would be any chance that the United States would not massively retaliate against Iran, all right? So that's a given, all right? But a couple of other things are different. Iran, for the foreseeable future, will not be able to threaten the U.S. homeland. It's, they're years away from an ICBM capability, let alone one that they could put a nuclear uh, a weapon on. And the United States has very robust national missile defense and, and increasingly robust theater, ballistic missile defense uh, capabilities to shoot those things down, which means the Iranians would not be able to hold the U.S. homeland at risk to nearly the degree that the Soviets were. And the United States has overwhelming conventional superiority vis-a-vis -vis Iran, which means we have escalatory uh, options below the level of nuclear escalation, which wasn't the case with the Soviet Union, where we had to, in fact, default to nuclear escalation because of Soviet conventional capabilities in, in Western Europe. So the reason I went through all of that is to suggest that actually the Cold War model about deterrence and containment is, is, not, is it's not the wrong model because Iran is harder to deter and contain. It's the wrong model because Iran is not the Soviet Union, and in fact, they should be easier to deal with. Not easy, but easier uh, to deal with ultimately than the Soviets ever were. Uh, just a quick response on that. I, 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 so I agree with Colin. I think that the Soviet Union might not be the, the best um, point of comparison. So I'd agree that on, on one hand, Iran is, is much less uh, threatening than the Soviet Union was. I completely agree with Colin on, on that. Uh, on the other hand, I think there are things about uh, Iran and, and, you know, if you think about the nuclear balance between Iran and Israel around the United States, they're actually more frightening. Uh, than during the Cold War. A lot of the things that we think led to stability between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War, like secure second strike capabilities, uh, large countries, long uh, distances between the countries that allowed time, uh, ballistic missile flight time that allowed time for communication, uh, hotlines between the two capitals. All of those things, I think, are missing when you think about the Iran-Israel nuclear balance. Uh, so, I you know, uh, so I think that that uh, is reason to believe that it, it would be a less stable nuclear balance than the U.S.-Soviet one was. And just one more point, I think, uh, you know, a better comparison might be, say, Pakistan or, or North Korea. And some people say, well, Pakistan and North Korea got nuclear weapons and, you know, it hasn't led to the end of the world yet. Why would, why should we worry about Iran? But, you know, I think if you think of either of those countries, they're, they've, you know, think about Pakistan. Uh, so Pakistan's provided uranium enrichment technology to Iran, Libya, North Korea. Part of the reasons that Iran and North Korea are so far with their uranium enrichment programs are because they got help from Pakistan. Uh, there's an academic debate, but many argue that Pakistan's been more aggressive, more willing to attack India since it's had nuclear weapons. Uh, we've had a number of nuclear scares between India and Pakistan. U.S. officials were worried in each of those crises that it could escalate into nuclear war. Uh, we're constantly concerned that uh, nuclear weapons in Pakistan could fall in the hands of terrorists, that Pakistan could collapse and we'd have a loose nukes problem. And Pakistan's only had nuclear weapons for a little over 10 years. They tested in 1998. So we still haven't seen the full range of consequences of a nuclear on Pakistan. 
uh, we could still have a nuclear exchange uh, involving Pakistan in, in the future. So I think these are all the things that we should be worried about with, with a nuclear armed Iran. It could be more aggressive, could transfer nuclear material to U.S. Uh, adversaries. They could fall. The country could collapse. They've had a history of a revolution. The nuclear weapons could fall in the hands of terrorists, and we could have a nuclear war. Say a couple more questions in the back. Um, okay, well, the first point that you just mentioned in that last round, um, Israel and Saudi is being vital to U.S. interests. Um, most of our oil does not come from Muslim countries, so Saudi Arabia is not necessarily vital. I won't start on the Israel thing. The other thing I want to Price of oil is fungible. I, we should just, for the record, it doesn't matter who we buy our oil from. The price is determined by the total amount of supply. You no, take no, the no, biggest I mean, supplier there, there off the market, about <laughs> the price will go up a astronomically. So know, it matters I for know. the U.S. economy whether we buy it from, their oil, from them or uh, not. The I just want to make that clear. The other 800-pound elephant or 1,000-pound elephant in the room Sorry, is... Sorry, can you speak directly into the microphone? It's hard to hear up here. First of all, does Iran have a bomb? Do they? No. Okay. Just want to get that clear. Um, we've been hearing for about, oh, gee, back to like 16 years ago that they're having a bomb. And um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Um, and I was actually at a talk with Stephen Walt. One of you wrote for foreign policy, so you're probably familiar with him. And he was actually saying it would be a benefit for Iran having a bomb because we wouldn't be constantly threatening World War III against them if they did. Look what happened with North Korea back when we went into Iraq. I remember watching that when Colin Paolo was uh, like sitting there saying that, oh yeah, North Korea is no problem or anything. And we're going to, into Iran, I mean Iraq. Um, anyway. Sorry, we're running kind of short on time. Do you have a question? I'm just, just saying, I'm, I'm just gonna ask you. I, I didn't even know what you Do you really think that, that it's really beneficial for us to go to war with them? You know what? I, I, let's let's cut the chase. I think I think both of us agree they don't have a bomb now. We disagree about how close they are uh, to getting one. Uh, neither one of us thinks military option is great. Matt thinks it's a little greater than I do, uh, and neither one of us is arguing that Iran getting a nuclear weapon would be a good thing. Uh, uh, the debate is about uh, whether uh, the margin of badness and the proximity of badness justifies uh, going to war uh, sooner rather than later. So I, I hope we made our positions clear on that relative. Uh, um, yeah. yeah, in the front right here. Thank you. I'm Jenny Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. I would say that um, this is a global question, security and peace. And so would you like to bring in our global adversary, China, into the pictures. Would Dr. Kronick and Dr. Kao speak for both of your solutions with China in the picture? And also with our recent pivoting um, focus to Asian Pacific. How would that affect our interest, national interest in the Asian Pacific if China is involved with the Iran picture? Thank you. Well, I think we uh, have been trying to work closely with China on our uh, non-proliferation policy with Iran. We've been frustrated uh, with the Chinese. They've been unwilling to uh, come along with us uh, and, uh, we, to go as long as, as far as we would like in terms of their support for sanctions and other things. Uh, but we have uh, tried to work with them. Uh, and I think, you know, in the, in the case of military, uh, the military option, I think it's very unlikely that China would, would support the military option. But I also think it's unlikely that they would uh, you know, directly uh, retaliate in, in any meaningful way against the United States. I think they would probably protest uh, diplomatically, uh, but that would be it. In terms of the pivotage, I think that, you know, many people do see um, uh, uh, China and um, East Asia as the future center of geopolitical politics, and the United States should uh, stop uh, spending so much time in, in the Middle East and, and pivot toward Asia. Uh, but I'm afraid that the Middle East is going to continue to throw up these thorny uh, national security challenges that are going to keep uh, drawing us back. Uh, and I actually think, you know, uh, believe it or not, that the that simply acquiescing to a nuclear armed Iran could actually lead to a greater U.S. military and political commitment in the Middle East over the long run uh, than a strike would, because uh, I think it would cement the Iranian regime in power. It would mean
mean that we sign formal defense pacts with uh, allies and partners in the region. It would mean that we forward deploy troops uh, in the region to make those defense pacts uh, credible. And I think that would remain in place uh, as long as Iran exists as, and, as a state and has nuclear weapons, which could be decades or even longer. You know, um, look, China's a key player uh, in, on the diplomatic uh, uh, side of this. I think at the end of the day, a diplomatic solution that Iran signs up to uh, with the P5 plus one, the permanent five members of the Security Council, of which China is a member plus uh, Germany, uh, would allow the United States over time to reduce its posture in the Middle East and therefore would facilitate uh, a pivot to Asia. Currently, the United States has about 40,000 forces in the Gulf, uh, even after the drawdown uh, uh, from, from Iraq, two carrier strike groups, uh, uh, you know, and a, and a lot more folks uh, on, on Iran's eastern flank in Afghanistan and the Central Asian uh, Republic. So we've got a lot of folks there. The pivot to Asia, I think, a lot of it hinges on the Iran scenario. I think Matt's right about that. The, if, you, if you want to pivot to Asia, the best solution is a diplomatic solution that allows us to reduce our forward posture in the Gulf, which is largely oriented around Iran. But if you want to guarantee we can't pivot to Asia and deal with China, then do what Matt says. Uh, because if you do a surgical strike on Iran, we are locked into the Gulf in tens of thousands in perpetuity to prevent Iran from reconstituting its program. For 10 years, sorry, 12 years, the United States sanctioned, inspected, enforced a no-fly zone, and periodically bombed Saddam Hussein. And it still took an invasion and an <coughs> occupation to get rid of every last remnant of, of, of his program. So if you liked that, you'll love this. <laughs> um, I think we have time for only one more question um, in the front row right here. Thank you. My name is Cameron Palavani. Um, my affiliation is humanity, a U.S. citizen, and a taxpayer. And my question, well, first, a few, a few facts that may not be known to most people. Uh, Persians are not Arabs. They're Iranian. Uh, number two, the health of the Ayatollah isn't that well. Uh, that's common knowledge over there. Number three, the only person that's made any uh, rash statements about bombing anything is Ahmadinejad, and he's on his way out. Um, so I'm not too sure what the, what's going on here with uh, the war rhetoric. It's been very costly for us as U.S. citizens. It's been costly for human lives there and here for our U.S. citizens that go to war. I have a lot of friends that are in the military, and it's, it's, there's post-drama things that go on when you go to war. Um, there is no threat. Our... our Military, the United States military, is more powerful than any military in the world. And I don't see anyone coming to attack the U.S. homeland, whether they have nukes or not. I mean, Russia never, the Soviet Union never did it. Now, you can't, I'm sorry, yes, you, I have a question. Okay. I have a question. I'm getting to a question. But the facts are this, before we go into another costly war, uh, how, if Iran were to acquire nukes, how does that directly threaten the U.S. homeland, it may threaten, Israel may see it as a threat, but Israel is not the United States, and us as United States citizens should worry about our interests domestically, about our financial situation. We took a trillion dollar hit recently, and why do we need to go around the world worrying about other people's affairs when our affairs here need to be concentrated on? And, uh, Sorry, we... we we have, yeah, we don't have I understand. Time. There's just so many things I, to this. I understand. I'm just trying to figure out why we're in this situation right now. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's a mistake to think that the United States is worried about Iran's nuclear program as somehow a favor to Israel. As, as the President said very clearly last week, a nuclear armed Iran poses a, a direct threat to the United States, to, to the international community. The United States and the international community uh, has an interest to prevent a nuclear armed Iran. And I, I laid out, I think, before some of the, the real threats that a nuclear-armed Iran would pose to the United States and to the U.S. interest. Um, but just to directly answer your question, you know, uh, the, the big one is, is nuclear war. Uh, Secretary Gates said when he was Secretary of Defense that Iran would have ballistic missiles, if it got outside help, capable of reaching the United States within five years. Uh, the United States and Iran are enemies. Uh, we've traded threats and counter threats. We, we fought a, a tanker war in the late 1980s. I think that the United States and Iran uh, would very well, uh, could very well find itself in conflicts and that those conflicts could escalate and possibly result in nuclear war on the U.S. homeland. So these are, the, I think, the biggest uh, stakes possible. You know, I actually want to say a few things about the, uh, about the Supreme Leader, um, separate from his health. Uh, 
by the way, I don't, I don't think either Matt or I uh, uh, declared that the Iranians were Arabs. Um, but the Supreme Leader, uh, you know, I don't know him personally. Um, Ahmadinejad has certainly said, President Ahmadinejad has certainly said more inflammatory things than the Supreme Leader, but I think we should keep in mind the Supreme Leader three weeks ago at a Friday sermon called Israel a cancer that had to be cut out of the, uh, of the Middle East that's not friendly. Uh, uh, so I think there's some threats uh, going, uh, going all around. Um, but the Supreme Leader has also said uh, that his program is for peaceful purposes. I don't know whether I believe him or not. Uh, he's also said that it would be a grave sin against Islam uh, to either acquire or use nuclear weapons. I don't know if I believe that he believes it or not. Actually, I don't care. What I care about is that both of those statements provide an opportunity, a window of opportunity for a face-saving way out. That is what I think the Supreme Leader is doing, is saying that if he does have to back down and sign on to a final diplomatic solution, he can convey to his people, well, I only wanted a peaceful program after all. And I always said that acquisition of nuclear weapons would be a grave sin against Islam, so we didn't lose. In into signing up to some diplomatic deal, we didn't lose. So I don't care what he thinks. All I care about is what he says. Some of the stuff he says is abhorrent. Other stuff he says provides a window, I think, to get a deal. And that's what we all need to be focusing on, is how do we get a deal? How do you get an interim deal uh, to stop some of the most dangerous activities they're involved in, such as the enrichment to 20% levels, which could dramatically uh, reduce their dash time? How can you stop them from installing more centrifuges in Fordo, which is driving the Israeli uh, strike clock? And how can you use confidence building measures in the near term to build up to a final agreement that gives assurances that they're not going for nuclear weapons while respecting their rights under the NPT? That's what we should focus on. I think the Supreme Leader has given just enough space, plus he said a couple days ago that you know, he kind of gave a backhanded compliment to Obama for saying that there was a window for diplomacy. So whatever. This isn't about who wins or loses. It's about preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. And this debate is not a disagreement about whether an Iranian nuclear weapon is, is good or bad. I think it would be bad, but less bad uh, than Matt thinks. But we both think it would be bad. We also both think it would be better to prevent than contain. That's not where the disagreement is. The disagreement is, is I don't think we should rush into another war. And we shouldn't, certainly shouldn't do it. Uh, the way uh, Matt suggests, because I think that would make the problem worse. Okay, um, we're going to do th each of them three minutes for closing remarks. So, let's start with Matt. Okay, um, great. Well, the question we were uh, brought here to discuss tonight is: uh, Should the United States use force against Iran's nuclear facilities to prevent Iran from uh, acquiring nuclear weapons? Uh, now, Colin and I both agree that if we could get a diplomatic settlement, that that would be uh, ideal. Uh, I'm, I'm skeptical uh, that we can get such a deal, and I'm afraid that the choice the U.S. president is soon going to have to make is should we strike Iran's nuclear facilities or uh, simply w roll over and uh, allow Iran to acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, now, Colin argues that we, that we have time uh, and we, we should wait. Um, but we've been dealing with this uh, problem since 2003, and we've been standing by as, as Iran has crossed many red lines uh, over the past uh, 10 years. Uh, and we've watched them. Uh, I'm afraid that if we continue to stand by, Iran is going to continue to cross red lines, and we're going to wake up uh, and find out that Iran has nuclear weapons without having had a serious national d debate about whether this is in our interest uh, and how we can prevent it. Uh, so instead, I think that we uh, should be proactive and make it very clear to the Iranians that if they uh, enrich above 20 percent, if they kick out international inspectors, that the United States will use force uh, to prevent them from doing that. And then we place the uh, responsibility to avoid catastrophe on Iran's shoulders. Uh, they can uh, back down to avoid conflict, or if they continue down their current path, they can invite uh, a conflict that's going to be much worse for them than it is for us. Um, so in sum, I argue that we should set these red lines. If Iran crosses them, conduct a surgical strike, pull back, and absorb an inevitable round of retaliation. Uh, I'm still not sure what Colin's bottom line is, uh, but I am pretty sure that nothing he said tonight convinced me that if we are faced with that decision, uh, that uh, a strike is not the least bad option. Thank you. Well, you know, there's this old uh, saying in debate that, that silence means consent. So I want to talk about a few things that Matt uh, that, I, that I mentioned that Matt didn't uh, respond to um, and let you draw some conclusions. You know, Matt says that he's afraid that Iran will continue to make progress, but, but of course he's admitted that they're not on the brink of having uh, a nuclear weapon. They don't have one now. They're at least a year away from being able to do it from a point of decision. He, 
he concedes the point that they're not likely to make that decision for a number of years. So I don't know whether we should do military action or not. I actually, as the negative, don't have to draw a firm conclusion about that. Only he does. Uh, but I know one thing for certain, now is not the time uh, to, do, uh, to use military action. Actually, I don't hear Matt disagreeing with me. Uh, I hear a lot of if this, then that, then this, then that. Uh, but there are a lot of ifs in the chain, a lot more ifs, actually, than, uh, than Matt uh, would admit. The other thing that Matt strangely doesn't respond to is the fact that it's perfectly conceivable that even if di diplomatic and, uh, prevention efforts and sanctions fail, that Iran may pause and stop at a virtual capability. In some ways, that's the best of all worlds for them. It allows them to have a minimal deterrent against attack while not bringing the world down on them. If that's the case, then the only way to move them from a virtual capability to a full-fledged capability, which has all the downside risks that Matt suggests, is to do what Matt advocates, which is to strike them, settle the internal debate about whether they should go all the way to a nuclear bomb, and guess what? They will and we'll spend the next decade trying to prevent them from doing it. Meanwhile, the inspectors won't be there. We won't know what uh, they're doing, and the risks of a nuclear run go up, not down. A military strike at this time is not a way to ensure that they don't get a weapon. It's a way to ensure that they'll go for a weapon. Right? Another thing that, that uh, Matt doesn't uh, talk about, he, does, he admits that they're not likely to use or transfer the weapon. He admits that even if crises become more likely, they're not likely to turn into nuclear crises, because unlike India and Pakistan that are right next to each other, Iran and Israel are far away, and the types of crises that would be involved in are inherently peripheral to Iranian interests, which means they wouldn't turn them into existential conflicts that risk the annihilation of the regime that Matt agrees is rational. So the scenarios for a nuclear war are hyped. That doesn't mean that it's inconceivable. It just means the risks are very low. In, in, in contrast, we know what happens if, if you agree with Matt. We launch another war. Right? And the costs of that, I think, are pretty clear. He also doesn't say uh, anything about the fact that proliferation cascades have actually never happened uh, and that Iran is likely to, not likely to be able to uh, push us out of the Middle East or bully us around. So it's not clear to me, if you want to make the argument in, in unconditionally for a military attack, you have to believe the threat is imminent and grave, and I don't think Matt has demonstrated either one of those things. I think it's also clear that the strike that he advocates wouldn't work Right? It, its surgical nature is actually a bad thing, not a good thing, uh, and uh, it would be difficult uh, to control escalation. It would have all sorts of downside destabilizing uh, consequences. So we just need to settle down. We need to take a breath. We're not at the point of decision. We may not be at the point of decision uh, for a number of years. And beating the drums of war, all this loose talk about war, is what the president uh, said the other day, is not a good thing. Right? It's already spooking oil markets. It's already having downside risks. We have an opportunity for diplomacy to play out, and we should let that play out. And if you agree, you should vote negative. Um, join me in thanking both of our debaters for coming out.